We're going to close things out talking about this Ferris State-Pittsburgh State game a little bit more because it really was just a game of that magnitude that deserves to be talked about at this fashion. And again, Ferris State, which by the way, unveiling the new unis right there, the new blacks, the black sleeves, pretty good look. We saw a lot of Trinidad uh, right here, the quarterback that was in for Ferris State, looked a little bit shaken up on a couple of those rollouts. You noticed, if you watch the film here, both of his picks were on rollouts. I don't know if it's part of their game that maybe they have to work on a little bit more. Uh, Something that we have seen a good bit out of uh, Ferris State, excuse me. They like to spread the ball out and get the ball in the hands of their playmakers. Usually that comes a lot of times. You see Garson Golker, the other part of that two-quarterback tandem. He had a little bit of an uncharacteristic rough day as well. You see the forced fumble there recovered by the Gorillas, which was a turning point in this game down in Carney Smith Stadium. But usually we see that in the form of some quick screen passes and other things from Ferris State to get on the outside and get their playmakers in space. Felt like they got a little bit away from their game plan. Definitely not as many snaps or carries from Carson Golker as I was expecting in this one. You expect Ferris to dominate the line of scrimmage, but against a defense like Pittsburgh State, they simply were unable to. Here's the second of the two interceptions. What a toe-tapping grab there on the sideline to get the ball back in the hands of the Gorillas. And I mean... This game was incredible. This uh, thoroughly, this game it, it just reminds me a little bit of you know, and again, it's a it's a different Gilliac squad. But remember last year we opened up with Grand Valley State playing Colorado School of Mines, two of the best teams in the country, and they set the bar so unbelievably high for D two football. This game has done that, and probably then some. Like the, I think this has piqued so many people's interest for D two football, and I love the fact that we have the week zero to have these opportunities to go and do that stuff. I think it's gonna you know this level of football, and especially this early in the season, you're only gonna. To get more and more people to tune in to the great product that is D2 football. But the Gorillas take it 19 to 3. And when you break down the stats on this one, and like I kind of alluded to it earlier, um, Carson Golker only had one pass attempt. That one was incomplete. He only had eight carries on the ground, and they stuffed him in 31 net yardage on the day for a quarterback and a guy who we've seen break records running the ball for the Bulldogs there and who is a very potent runner. Uh, Trinidad Chambliss, he was 13 for 20, 133, two interceptions. Uh, Both of them were sacked twice behind the line of scrimmage. And again, this is not a knock on Ferris State. We know they're going to be an incredible team going down the line. This is a look how good Pittsburgh State can potentially be. This is like, look how good and dangerous this Gorilla Squad is. I think that's the highlight in what you see from that. And it's not like they dominated the ground game either. They didn't have a rusher over 50 yards. The passing game was not, you know, anything too crazy. Dodson, we talked to, 22 for 33, 206 yards and an interception. Nothing incredibly flashy. Some good numbers for sure. He spread the ball out. There were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 different Gorillas that caught passes in this one. You love to see that. Some great depth at those positions, and he talked about some of those guys that are their big pass catchers coming back, but defensively, Pittsburgh State showed up, showed out. I'll leave it at that. We're going to talk a lot more about both those squads moving on, but uh, that game was certainly one for the books. Let's move over and talk about another GLIAC squad, this time, though, matching up with an NSIC foe, Michigan Tech. They make the trip down to number 25. Uh, By the way, all the rankings I use here are based off the AFCA. Sometimes I go back and forth at d2football.com and AFCA, but um, the rankings today I'll use from the AFCA, and I'll let you know that ahead of time. But uh, Michigan Tech, they traveled down to number 25 Bemidji State in Minnesota. And this game, for those of you uh, who did not tune in, first of all, I apologize because... uh, You know, this one was a very fun game to watch. The Beavers end up taking this one, but they couldn't do it in regulation. They needed a little bit of extra time. They take it 19-13 to in OT down at Chet Anderson Stadium. And uh, this one was just entertaining all around. You see Freeze getting out of the pocket and scrambling there. He did quite a bit of that over the course of this one. But... That's not to say Michigan Tech's offense struggled because you look at Freeze's final stat line, 28 for 43 with 261 and a touchdown. No turnover through the air for Michigan Tech either. And and something that jumps off the page for me right away, 43 pass attempts from a Michigan Tech offense that we just have not seen that from. So maybe developing a little bit new of a new identity there for the Huskies, especially on the road to see that. Um, quite a few carries on the day, but uh, a lot of those unfortunately were behind the line of scrimmage freeze, sacked three times. That defensive line from Bemidji State with returning the likes of guys like Mark and ha- Marcus Hansen, excuse me, the reigning defensive player of the year in the Northern Sun, uh, you see one of those plays right here, bringing them down the line of scrimmage. That defensive line from Bemidji State, 
I would put it right up there. The best in the conference for them. One of the best in the country. If they continue at this clip, we saw glimpses of that last year, and it certainly seems that they're picking up right on pace this year. Bemidji State also getting it done through the air. We talked about them losing their quarterback, their signal caller, and Brandon Alt from last year, who was quite the stud on offense. That was the overtime winner for the Beavers. They pick up the win at home. What a statement win for that Bemidji squad. Take a look at it from another angle. Drops it in the breadbasket. Back left corner of the end zone. And that would do it. We got it from three angles. How about that? How about that? Great ball placement. Great catch. Bemidji State picks up the W. And, uh, you know, again, still a lot of times where this is not a, a rip on Michigan Tech. Michigan Tech played a really quality game. Their offense obviously came up short at a few points. And, and we talked about it. We knew the defenses for both these teams were going to be more of the focal point heading into the season, especially early on, right? We're in week zero. The offenses are still trying to figure things out. But, you know, I think there were really bright points for Michigan Tech's offense, and we didn't really know. There were some question marks uh, around who was going to have that production. Having Darius Willis back, he still he got his, you know what I mean, over 100 yards on the day for the receiver there for the Huskies. But it, there's still a lot of things to fix, obviously, for the Huskies. You didn't come away with a win. There's a lot of things to be proud of for that Michigan Tech squad to go in there and put up a really good game at Midji State. But Midji, though, that's a big-time win for them to start the year off in the non-conference slate and uh, get ready for some really big-time Northern Sun competition. Now, they were actually not the only Northern Sun team to go out and have some great success. This team, though, I, I would definitely argue one in the more emphatic fashion and on the road Nothing less. Uh, I'm talking about Minnesota State, Mankato. The Mavericks go down to Northwest Missouri State. And to paint the scene for you, we talked about it in last week's episode. The Bearcats from Northwest Missouri State were 123-12 and at home since 2012, I believe it was. That number is somewhere around there. All that to say, they have been dominant at home the last almost uh, over a decade. Right, so Minnesota State will play the will play the highlights here. Minnesota State goes down into town to take on the Bearcats. Mankato slated at number thirteenth in the country. The Bearcats number twenty two, respectively. Mankato comes in there. Not only did they come out and play well, here's Eckern to under center for Mankato and the Mavericks. They came out and dominated in the first half. And they did it offensively and they did it defensively. They kind of did it in all three phases of the game. You see it here. They get out and score early. The tight end sneaks into the end zone. They left the Bearcats scrambling in the first half. And you want to know the number? Well, it was, let's see here, do a little bit of math, 22 to zip. After the first half, the Mavericks were up. Now, Northwest, their offense would find a little bit of its stride in the second half. This one, the final 36-22, to Mankato with a big-time win down in Bearcat Stadium there. And when you kind of break down the stats, Hayden Eckern was 18 for 25, 205 yards and a tud. Did have a pick on the day. Um, and how about another face at quarterback for the Bearcats in, in uh, Chris Runke, excuse me. We had Mike Hoensey on the program a couple times. Got a tryout with the Dallas Cowboys. Really like Mike. There's Chris doing his thing, throwing a dot into the end zone for one of their scores in the day. Good to see him and good to see that Northwest offense start to find their identity with a new guy under center for the Bearcats. He had a great day. 15 for 24, 268, and three tuds for him. Now, Northwest, though, where they really struggled was on the ground. Their uh, running back, starting running back there in, uh, uh, in Braden, I, was, I believe is, is his name, a net 13 yards on eight carries, and then Runke was sacked a few times. He finished with a net of negative 32 yards on the day. So Mankato, the NSIC apparently comes out and has some really quality defensive line play, and that front seven for both Bemidji and Mankato showed out in both of these contests. But uh, you look through defensively, and there's a couple of guys that jump off the page. Cody Brown, who uh, I guess I, I don't, that's a pretty good segue to pull up our uh, – Players of the Week selections. I can go through those from Division Two. Cody Brown was our Defensive Player of the Week selection when it comes to Division Two between us and the College Football Network. Let's see if I can find that real quick. Here he is for you guys. You see the stat line right there. Seven tackles, three of them behind the line of scrimmage. Two of those sacks, big-time playmakers for the big-time defensive linemen for the Mavericks. Love to see that if you're a Mankato fan. You got on the list our special teams player of the week coming from that same game and Cole Lamel. How about four punts with an average of almost 52 yards? He had one that went 64? Hello, have a day, kid, over there punting the ball. Um, I will say... When your punter's having a great game, it usually is not the best indicator for your offense. That certainly seems to hold true here for Northwest in this particular instance. But uh, nonetheless, 
Very, 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 I cannot stress this enough, big time win for Mankato to go on the road and have that result in what is, I know, a very hostile environment in front of almost 5,000 people down there in Missouri. So, exciting stuff. Very good stuff for uh, Mankato. I'm running out of breath because I'm so excited talking about this stuff, guys. But uh, we'll close things off. The Black College Football Hall of Fame Classic in Canton Hall of Fame Stadium. We had Virginia State versus Benedict. And I will not be able to show the clips from this, you guys, because I believe that one was broadcast um, somewhere that has the rights to it. So I don't want to go ahead and take that and then get that taken down. But Virginia State comes out. Benedict is a team that has obviously gotten their flowers and, and rightfully so the last couple of seasons. We know it's a defense that has been very staunch defensively in that first front seven and has done a really good job in conference but Virginia State comes in 23 to 7 and they really did dominate a win over Benedict um it was the, like I said, the Black College Football Hall of Fame Classic at Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium in Canton. And uh, Benedict actually took the lead early, which is uh, a little bit surprising. But then Virginia State just started to roll. They were uh, they outgained Benedict 384 yards to 233 in total yardage. Uh, their running back, uh, Jamil Williams, led the way. He had 23 carries for 150 yards, two touchdowns. He was the game's uh, offensive MVP. A little bit of a delay in the third quarter, some lightning and things, but uh, the Trojans did not miss a beat. They kept going there, and uh, they seem to have some really promising stuff going forward. Between Virginia State and Virginia Union, who uh, we're not going to talk about too much, but they had a big-time W uh, this week as well. The Virginia D2 football scene, Seems to be in pretty good hands. I'll go through and mention just some other names maybe that are worth mentioning. How about Carson Newman in their first game under new head coach over there? 50-7 to win over Reinhardt running the triple option. They bring over the guy, I'm blanking on his name right now, from I believe Navy. Central State put up a pretty good fight against FCS opponent Moorhead State. We had uh, East Stroudsburg take the win, the PSAC victory over Edinburgh. Fairmont State looked pretty solid. Delta State with a big-time win, 47-16 over Mars Hill. That was one that we had talked about last week and previewed. Going down the list, Missouri Western comes up win uh, comes up with a win in a close one versus uh, Northeastern State in MIAA matchup. Sol Ross falls short in their first D2 matchup against West Texas A&M. Keep going down the list here. You've got a Nebraska Kearney with a win over Shadron State, 18-6. And then it looks like... CSU Pueblo was also one that uh, looked really, really good. Reggie Retzlaff, the receiver over there, 35-6 to over South Dakota Mines. He had himself quite the day. Uh, the Thunder Wolves looked very, very good, very dangerous. So excited to see them play Grand Valley here very shortly. That's going to be a, a good one, I believe. Not this coming week, but the week after. And then finally, Mesa takes a big win over Kingsville. But that's kind of the D2 stuff for today.